Andiamo in cucina e facciamo un po' di baldoria. Let's go to the kitchen. Let's have some fun. Today, to make Marines Farro Salad, one of the most romantic recipes I've ever made. Gambero al cocio, one of the first recipes my father Vincenzo taught me how to make. Brasciola, what's life without brasciola? And for dessert, the magical Aunt Politi's strawberries. And find out how naming a dish is a good way to remember someone special in your life. Come for the recipes. Stay for the story. Naming a dish after someone as the ultimate act of love, I think uh, it truly is. It truly is because if the dish is great, uh, you will have a memory of the person forever. Uh, every time you taste it, every time you try it, you remember him or her. So I think that having a dish named after somebody is very important. Farro salad is not a Sicilian specialty. On top of it, where did I come up with the name Maureen? Well, this is a very romantic story. One of my best friends, his name is Brian. He went to Italy with his wife, Maureen. They went to Florence and they had lunch at this restaurant. And it was magic. When he got back, he called me and said, Nick, you gotta do me a favor. You have to teach me how to make farro. So I had to study myself. I had to ask for advice and counsel to many of my friends who were quite uh, adept with this particular recipe. And I created my own version of it. And I called it Maureen. But the best part of it all is that Brian called me at home after he made it for his family and he said to me, Nick, I can't thank you enough. What you did for me for a brief moment brought me back to Florence. And I looked at my wife and she looked at me and we knew exactly how joyous the moment was. So if this recipe that I made and I gave to my friend Brian worked so well for him and his family, who knows? It might give you the opportunity to visit Italy every time you take a bite. So here it is, Corinne's Farm. The first edition always starts with farro. Remember that when you cook farro at home, it doubles up in size. So whatever amount you put in, you're gonna end up twice as much. Look how gorgeous it is. And this is what I love about it. This is already very crunchy, very nutty, has a unique flavor of its own. I think that the enjoyable aspect of farro is with every bite that you take, to have something fresh crunching inside your mouth, emitting a juice, a flavor of their own. These are my favorite ones. Let me show you. Here I've diced up nicely some uh, yellow, orange, and red pepper. So once I add it in, you wanna mix it real well together. The next thing that I've done is some chopped onions, red onions, chopped them very, very fine. I'm gonna add them as well. Uh, all these flavors, by the way, as they sit together, they will bring out a character all of their own. Then the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to add olives, Kalamata olives. When you use Kalamata olives, make sure that you use the one that don't have the pit. If you are crazy enough to put whole Kalamata olives in there with the pit as well, you're not gonna make friends, you'll make a lot of enemies. So what I do very attentively, if I have the old fashioned, old school ones, I take the pit out and then I slice them. In this case, I was lucky enough, my market actually carry Kalamata olives without the pit, which was very advantageous to me and allows me to do this wonderful design. The reason why I like the olives inside the insalata di farro is for the little explosion of saltiness that they bring in. Every addition that you make, make sure that you turn, twist, mix everything on the inside. It's like you're inviting a bunch of friends to a party and you want them to enjoy it. Now let's go with the other spices. Salt, sea salt, abundant salt to make sure that everything has a personality. Pepper, I like to ground it fairly coarse and that's when I add it and that's exactly what we're doing. And the addition mix, make sure that everything is very well mixed. What I love is the color that this has. But still, we are not there. We need to add a few more things. Onion powder. The reason why I like onion powder is because it brings out another element of very interesting flavors to this because it's a layer that we're building, layer on layer on layer. Then we're gonna go again with some parsley or basil if you don't have parsley. Both of them would work very well. Mix them in. Now, the salad is already beautiful to look at it, but is this a salad yet? We need to put the dressing and the dressing is very complicated. It only has two ingredients, the best of olive oil that you can find and freshly squeezed lemon juice. Let me show you. 
extra virgin olive oil, mix it in, get it everything nice and moist. This oil is gonna do several things for you. The flavor that the oil has is gonna to add to the salad and impart its own flavor. Maybe because I'm from Sicily, but also because I like a stronger flavor. Then you could use vinegar if you wanted to, but in this case, I find the lemon juice is much, much better. It marries well with everything. So here we are. All that you have to do at this point, once everything is nicely mixed the way in which we have it mixed, is to let it rest. One optional addition that you can make is an addition of paprika. Why do I add paprika to an Italian recipe? Well, my uncle is from Hungary, Budapest, and uh, he married my aunt as he immigrated to Switzerland. And he's the one in our family who introduced us to paprika. My father fell in love with it, I fell in love with it, and I always find an excuse so that I can put paprika somewhere. In this case, it fits perfect. Now, once you mix all of these ingredients together, before you serve it, I would greatly advise to let it rest for at least a few hours. How much is a few hours? A minimum of two hours to as much as five hours. All those flavors will mingle and will blossom overnight, giving you this incredible flavor that it is indeed insalata di farro. But this is not just an insalata di farro. This is Maureen's farro salad. The farro salad has marinated now for a few hours, and now we are ready to plate it. Look how beautiful the color is shimmering. That is the extra virgin olive oil. Look at the colors of the peppers and how they bring it through. And you know, with every bite that you take, it's not just the pepper and the onion, but this is beautiful olives popping right through it. A little bit of the tartness of the lemon juice, and that is it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how you make Maureen's Parro Salad. And for that, you want to make sure you thank my good friend Brian, because he's the one that asked me to make it for her. The problem is, what is the naming process? I mean, if I come out and I name a dish after myself and I call it Nixtelino Super Pasta, oh, what honor is there? None. It's me making it up. And people will go, uh, well, I'll make Nixtelino Super. It's beautiful when the dish is named by others who have come to your house, who've eaten your food at your restaurant, who've watched your TV show, who've, who've read your recipe, who've followed you all these many years when they write you and they say, I have to tell you, the first time I met my wife, I asked her to come over to the house for dinner and I cooked one of your recipes. In our house, all the special recipes are called Nick's style. Gambero al cocio. What does it mean? Gambero in Italian means shrimp, al cocio. Cocio is an old fashioned pot in which shrimps were cooked, especially for large families. But what makes this recipe, in my opinion, not only interesting, but really unique is the way in which we use the shrimp. I know you will love it. So take a look. I'm gonna show you how to make gambero al cocio. This is a very special recipe for me. Why? I'll tell you in just a second. First, we start with some red pepper flake, garlic, slice thick, and I propose that you always slice it thick when you make this dish because the garlic is gonna cook over a long period of time. If you add a chop, it will burn. Some onion. I like to use red onion just because it's fun. Also, at this point, a little bit of parsley. You wanna have the parsley fry in the pan. You wanna create the base right in here. Well, this is cooking just to ensure that everything works out. A little bit of salt as well. And the next thing that we're going to do, we are going to add the shrimp. What's unique about the shrimp? What makes this dish unique and perfect is the fact that the shrimp still has a shell on it. The shell protects the shrimp from overcooking. Now, for this shrimp to taste great, we need several few ingredients to add, the most important of which is wine. White wine, you can use any wine you want, but once you add the white wine, I want them to stir it about on high heat and reduce it until it gets down to a glaze. As I do this, what I'm trying to also do is pick up any brown bits that might stuck at the bottom of the pan. Now I'm using a wonderful non-stick pan, so there really is not gonna be that much, but you have to realize when you cook this at home, especially if you're cooking with a stainless steel pan, there are some very dark spots that accumulate at the bottom of the pan. Often people think that, that something was burned. Instead, it's highly reduced juices. In this case, the shrimp, it's releasing its juice into the sauce. As it reduces into the sauce, it reduces, 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 picking up this wonderful balance that will reverberate with the other ingredients. But what are the other ingredients? A little bit of chicken stock. Chicken stock is my favorite because it does not fight. Rather, it picks up the personality of whatever you added onto it. If we added beef stock to this, it would have been a bit more difficult. Beef stock 
is very predominant in flavor. It tends sometimes to completely overtake the dish. And the next thing is tomato sauce. And once it reaches a boil, you want to simmer it until the shrimp is cooked absolutely perfect. Now, one of the things that I look at the dish to make sure that I have uh, some kind of a signal that tells me that the shrimp has gotten to where I want to go, I look at how firm it is, and I usually touch it with my spoon, and the way in which it bounces back, it tells me if it's cooked all the way through or if it's still soft. Depending on the size of the shrimp, you might need to adjust the cooking time, and pretty soon you'll develop an instinct on where to go. But cooked into the shell, you will be protected because it's very rare that this type of shrimp will overcook. The next thing that I like to do at this point is to add butter. Why do we add butter? Butter adds a certain creaminess to the sauce, and as it melts into the sauce, it gives us this wonderful juice. I'm gonna turn off the heat. The shrimp is cooked perfect. One last thing that I like to do is add a little bit of parsley, just so that the parsley cooks and marinades into the last bit of the heat of the sauce that's left over, and now, we're ready to play. Why do I love gamberol cocho? Maybe it's because one of the first recipes that I learned how to make. Maybe it's because it's the recipe that I made for my wife. Is it maybe because it's one of those things that nobody can make a mistake with? And then there's something else that I like about gamberol cocho, and that is the sauce. The sauce that I love to pour on top of it. I like to see it caress every single piece of shrimp. And the reason why I'm so abundant with the sauce is in the old days, when you used to make this for the family, my mom used to love to come by and pass to each and every one of us pane tostato. This is only the first two slices. By the time you'll be done with this, trust me when I tell you, you will have finished a whole loaf of bread. So for all of you out there, when the moment comes that the special one happens to walk in your life, make a recipe of gambero cocho. Who knows? It might change your life too. It changed mine. I think that this recipe that was my grandma's recipe ended up in someone else's home. And in the end, was one of the many reasons why the someone else found someone else's to love. Did my food have anything to do with it? I like to believe I did. The fact that my food is named by my name in their house every time they make it, that's better than cash in the bank. Because cash can be made and can be lost overnight food, the recognition, the stories that go with it. That's something that lives forever. Let me show you how to make bracciole, Sicilian style. And this is a recipe that you can adapt to just about anything that you want. You can even do it with veal, you can even do it with chicken if you don't like to do it with uh, meat. Simply pound the chicken breast very nice and thin, and the stuffing that I will teach you how to make is so flavorful, and it will also keep the meat very, very moist. So, let's make some bracciole. We start with the stuffing. Everybody can make stuffing, but this stuffing is unique. Now, what we've done with the stuffing, we started out with some garlic. Saute the garlic, to which we added a little bit of red pepper flakes, the onions, and then to that, we have added some chopped salami. What kind of salami? We went with soppressata. Why soppressata? I like the fat content of the soppressata. Also love the flavor that the soppressata has. You deglaze it with a little bit of white wine, and then you add parsley. We mix, we mix, we mix, and then what we add to it is bread, bread that I put into a food processor and basically shred it to pieces. So day old bread is what we like. But before we use it, what I do, I moisten the bread in milk, squeeze the excess milk, then add the bread to the onion and garlic mixture. We add one egg, plenty of pecorino cheese, some breadcrumbs to absorb the excess uh, humidity and moisture that might be in there, and the stuffing is made. Make sure that it cools off to room temperature before you use it to stuff the bracciole. All right, let's make us some bracciole. We start with the meat. Before we use it, this is what a slice of top round beef will look like. What I like to do is to pound it. But when it comes to pounding the bracciole, if you have an instrument like this, make sure you don't use the side. This will shred it aside. This is used to tenderize. What we want to use is the flat side of the mallet. So here we go. Once the meat is being pounded, to perfection. What you want to do is trim it. Do you need to trim it? You really don't. But for me, just because I like it perfect, I always like to cut the ends because they tend to be too thin. I turn the meat around to see if there is any significant amount of fat. It's just a little bit over here, which I'm taking off, as you can see. The rest is perfect. This, I will make two bracciole out of it. Let me show you how. I like to go just about right into the middle and cut it in half, just like this. Look how beautiful it is. Then we take 
the stuffing. What I like to do, the stuffing is nice and moist. As you see, it takes the shape of whatever I put into my hand. So I put it right here on top of the meat. I do a note in the other slice. Now, how do we make this into a brachiola? Let me show you. The first thing that you want to do is to take the meat from the top just like this, then from the bottom just like this. Remember, you flatten this out. Then you want to roll it up as if you were to make a burrito. So if you go from this side, you roll it, you roll it, you roll it. Look at this. Boom. There you are. This is the first part of the brachiola. Let's move this aside for a moment, and let me show you how to do it again with this other brachiola right here. So here we go. This is a different shape, as you can see. The first thing that we want to do is take it from the top. Remember, this is so soft that you can spread it so it covers the meat. The next thing is we roll it from the bottom, and then just like we did before, this time we do it from this side. You roll it in. There are two techniques on how to secure the bracciole. The most involved one is to actually tie them up with rope. The one that I like instead, that makes it quick and faster, is to skewer it with toothpick. Now, this is where the, the closure is. So what I want to do is to secure it in several spots, something like this, I like to give it at least three skewers and place it in just like this. Why is this important? These three skewers are gonna prevent the meat from spreading open or opening up in the middle of cooking. And remember, you're not reinventing the wheel here. You're just doing something that grandmas all over Italy and grandpas all over Italy do all the time. And if you grew up in an Italian American family, you know what I mean. So there we are. Now we're ready to bread the brachiole right before we cook it. There's a trick there. Let me show you how. This is not the typical recipe. Usually, brachiole, before they're cooked, they're rolled in flour. That's all that there is to it. And they're fried and they're put into the simmering sauce. As Sicilians, we do it different. Why? We're different. This is a technique you're gonna love. So in a bowl, we put the brachiole right into the bowl. I like to pour the olive oil so it's easy for the brachiole to be turned into the olive oil and be moistened on all the sides. In another bowl, a bigger one, I put the breadcrumbs and I put it abundant. The brachiole in here, and now what I do, I move it into the breadcrumbs. Look, just one turn, as you can see, immediately, the brachiole is perfect, completely covered up and down. The breadcrumbs, unlike the flour, not only seal the meat perfectly, but they give it the extra kick of flavor. Now, let's cook it. The oil is getting nice and hot for a searing. We have the sauce simmering in the back. Remember, to the sauce, we've done something unique. Not only this tomato sauce, but we also have added beef stock. Why beef stock? If we were to use just the sauce and we're just to simmer over a long period of time, because this will simmer for about 35, 40 minutes, what happens is most of the liquid will evaporate and then what you're left with is a very thick, gummy essence of tomato sauce. What the beef stock does for us, it maintains the perfect layout of the sauce. Wonderful and tasty all the way. Now, the oil is hot enough and we are ready to fry. Now, when you put them in, right before you put them in, shake them up a little bit. What I want you to do is to get rid of the extra bits that we have of breadcrumbs. What difference does it make? Not an enormous difference, really, but what it does, it reduces the amount of breadcrumbs that are gonna end up at the bottom of the pan. If there are too many breadcrumbs at the bottom of the pan, one of the things that can happen is that they burn, and they might ruin a little bit the flavor. But what you truly want to do is get this crust. You see how beautiful it is? This is the searing of the juices on the inside, and also prevents for the stuffing to pop out later on once you cook into the sauce. Oh, guarda che bel colore! Look what a beautiful color that is. I get overly excited about things like this. You know, to me, this is like getting back at home when I was a little boy, and I remember when my mom would be doing this, my brother and I coming back from school, we could smell the aroma in the kitchen as soon as we opened up the door, and we knew that that was going to be a great day. It always was. You don't need to cook them for too long. All you want to do is just to brown them, sear the flavors, and basically, we are ready to move them on. So here we are, now in the awaiting sauce. Once you put them into the simmering sauce, the one thing that you want to do is to cook them on simmer, not on high heat. In about 40 minutes, we're going to be ready to serve this, and it will be fantastic. When it comes to brachiole, there are two things. Best part, is, of course, is when you eat them. But the other part is when you actually plate them. As I look at them, I see the steam coming out, but I'm not done yet. I'm not done because the best is coming next. This is the national accompaniment for brachiole, mashed potatoes. Then the best part comes now. This sauce, to you, might be just red. To me, this sauce is gold, absolute gold. Sometimes, 
Perfection is exactly the way it is. Simple, right to the point. Signori e signori, from me to you, braccio. My grandma doesn't know it, but her food here in America is very famous in many houses, in many restaurants, amongst young people and old people. They get together and they make the recipes and they say, Mamma mia, it's fantastic. If my grandma only knew how famous she would have become. And Buliti's strawberries. And Buliti was my mother's sister, my second mom. And she really had magic when it came into the kitchen. And this is my favorite dessert that she used to make for us in summertime. So easy, so simple, so full of flavor. Let me show you how to make it. My Aunt Buliti is a very special woman. As long as I can remember, uh, I used to call mom, mom, and Zia Buliti, Zia Buliti, but to me, Zia Buliti, my Aunt Buliti, she was my other mom. I remember in elementary school, I think it was uh, fourth or fifth grade, getting in a fight with a boy, and he saying to me, she's not your mom, she's your aunt. And I remember going home, almost crying, and saying to my mom, they're telling me that Zia Buliti is not my mom. I always thought I had two moms. I still feel like she's my mom. She was wonderful. She had a unique way to talk to me and Mario and to calm us down. And she had an incredible way to reinterpret old school recipes and make them fantastic and very easy to make. This is one of the recipes on how she used to take care of me and my brother and make sure that we would behave. And especially in summertime, this is something you're gonna love making for your friends. I've taken strawberries and I have cut the strawberries in small pieces. I would say about a half an inch. And then what we have in here is orange sections. Now, these orange sections are unique because they're called supremes. What does it mean, supremes? Well, supremes is the orange section that you cut very astutely in between each section to make sure that you also take the skin off so you have the pure fruit. Does it make a difference if you don't do that? No, this way it's just more fancy schmancy. And you know me, I'm fancy schmancy. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to add some sugar. A little bit of sugar for those of you on a diet, a little bit more sugar for those of you that like to eat, and then if you're preparing it for me and my brother, you gotta put a little bit more sugar than this because sugar is king. This is what makes this sweet. Mix it all together. Let the sugar absorb properly. Now, a spice that's going to bring an interesting flow to this one is the addition of mint. Mint has a unique way of marrying with all of these ingredients and giving us exactly what we want, and this is what I do. I'll make sure that most of it is coated nicely. Fantastic. At this point, this is ready to be eaten already, but I have a secret weapon that I want to share with you. This, eh, see, right here, this is my secret weapon. Very easy to make. Uh, you can do it for this. You can use it to marinate chicken if you want to and grill it. You can use it as the base of many sauces. You can use it to top any kind of dessert you want. What we have done, we've taken about two cups of uh, freshly squeezed orange juice. Never use reconstituted, freshly squeezed orange juice. To two cups of orange juice, we have added one full cup of sugar, and we brought the whole mixture to a boil. We reduced it by half. As it reduces by half, if you're cooking for adults especially, we've also added about two ounces of orange liqueur, and we let this rest overnight so all the flavors come together. A little bit goes a long way. It's nice and thick. First, mix it all together just like this. Now. What I like to do, especially when I have a dinner party at my house, I like to make this at least a half hour ahead of time. What happens, all the flavors are gonna mix in just perfectly and they're going to bloom and blossom together. Basically, we are done. Now, let me show you how to plate this. The plating of this dessert is so simple, it's almost ridiculous, but you should imagine the way my aunt used to make it. She used to tease us. I'm using a slotted spoon because I like to add a little bit more of the sauce on top. But first, I want to bring all the fruit in exactly as it is. Oh, mamma mia, guarda che combinazione. I'm sorry, what I just said in Italian is look what a beautiful combination, and this is perfect. Then what I like to do, I like to take just a tiny bit of the extra syrup and just make it go right on top, exactly like this. And as you can see, the way in which she hugs every piece of fruit, it's even then more delicious because when you finally bite into it, all these elements come together. When summer comes, when I think of my family, I think of these beautiful moments I had with my family and my Aunt Bolita that created this dessert that made me and my brother be good boys, even in the hot summers with no air conditioning, when we're going crazy and driving everyone else around us crazy. This is magic. This is love. And this, this is how you make Aunt Bolita strawberries. So, yes. 
I think there is a specific honor assigned in naming the dish after someone, but it is a true honor if you are not the one doing the naming after yourself, rather if someone else does it. Not because they owe you something, not because they're trying to impress you, but because that dish in their mind, in their hearts, means something. That means that the conversation that you were trying to have, this joy that you were trying to share with someone else, found this impactful connection. That, that is magic. Just like my dad, I was wearing a suit. I, I was uh, cooking the last few bracciole. And this, as I reached for the bottle, the olive oil bottle, this slipped out of my hand. Boom, down into the ground, bada boom. It was an explosion. It was right on top of my pants, on top of my shoes. Suddenly, inside my own head, I heard, save the bracciole, save the bracciole, they're burning. I stood up, I looked around, I saw all the damage around me. I saw that the suit was finished, there was nothing left to it, and then I saw the bracciole. And I said to myself, dun da da, -da save the bracciole.